All right, kids, we are on slide 94 of 284. And don't freak out, the whole, not the whole last part, but when we get to about 150 or so, which is after the next part, portion of notes, um, we're going to um, do a little, something different with the notes. We're not gonna have a presentation like this. You're gonna have to look at them yourself, um, not in a presentation form. I'll put them, I'll post them on, um, Google Classroom, and then you're going to make something, a product from those notes, okay? So you're gonna have to do a little digging and mining through the notes to get what you need, all right? So we're talking about regulating sustainable fishing. Yes, this is obviously a big problem. We've seen this in the lobster wars and in sea spiracy. Um, so we've seen it from both sides, we know how challenging this is. And the biggest challenge, of course, is corruption. All right, so but this doesn't talk too much about that, so at all. Now you did have a, a question uh, for Bellwork on your notes. It said, why do you think this last statement is true? Perhaps you disagree, discuss, and um, make sure that you have that filled out because that's worth, uh, f those question questions are worth five points each, okay? So, a um, couple of blanks there um, on, in this portion of your notes right there. So, modern fishing technology, advantages, disadvantages. Mainly, advantages are mainly for the fishermen and human needs, and the disadvantages are mainly on the ecosystem and the fishing stocks, right? Obviously, okay. And it's inconceivable for all global fishing to be banned. So, that's the question that you have to agree or disagree with and why on your sheet, but that should have been done already. Okay, so moving on to what can be done, all right? And what needs to be done is a realistic aim it has to be agreed upon and followed through. You've seen like the cod example in, North, uh, in the North Sea, they agreed on stuff, but because of political reasons, um, those agreements were not followed through and only done minimally. So not putting future stocks at risk. How do we, how do we achieve that? So um, collecting data about fishing populations, determining the health of current populations. So we do need to constantly do studies of the populations. And that's what the NOAA vessel that I was uh, a researcher on, that's what they do. And the other vessels that NOAA has as well even though they have to replicate what the current fishers are doing, um, they still gain a lot of information. And we can only hope that that information goes to good use. Putting those restrictions in place, and then of course monitoring and enforcing those restrictions without corruption. So scientists, like the NOAA vessel, are employed. And they uh, determine the health of fish stocks. They set safe harvest quotas that will not cause them to, fa to fall, the harvest quotas to fall. And then, of course, there's always factors that have to be considered. What do they need to do before they recommend quotas? They have to estimate how much there is and predict the future. Once they estimate how much there is, predict what the future will need to be, they can set those limits on the, fish, on the fishing vessels, on the industry. <clears throat> and you can get this um, commercial saltwater regulations, I, I believe it's all online, and this is put out by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. This one is about 11 years old, but um, this is something that any commercial fisherman can and needs to follow. You, you have to pretty much have that memorized. Because if you break any of the rules, if you're targeting a certain species and you break any of the size rules or um, age rules or sex rules or 
location or net size or allowed, you know, numbers you're allowed to have on the vessel, you can lose your license and lose your livelihood. All right. So now we're at the bottom of page 17, slide 98, changes in fish population. So we're going to talk about something called recruitment and losses. So obviously recruitment is getting more, right? So how are you going to do that? Reproduction and immigration, uh, fish moving into the, your area. And losses, of course, decreasing population, m death, mortality, right? And emigration, fish leaving the area. So changes in population size depend upon the rate that new fish are entering. That's called recruitment and the rate at which they're leaving. If a fish leave a population faster than they enter, this seems kind of obvious, right? Population decrease and vice versa. So if fishing is to be sustainable, fewer fish must leave than enter. We've got the, the numbers are already too low. So the, num so the quotas have to be set so that more fish are coming in by one of these two ways than are leaving by one of these two ways. Fewer fish must leave than enter. Okay, slide 99. So what is recruitment again? Recruitment is arrival, right? And for fish, it's often considered to be the stage at which the fish have reached an age where they can be caught in nets. If they're below that age, they don't count towards this number. So the number of juvenile fish surviving to a particular stage and entering a population. This stage varies from species to species, obviously. Most authorities consider this to be a fish that has reached maturity. And they're looking at this, this central line here as the replacement line, which is kind of the replacement rate. It's an equal giving and taking, but for now they want more giving of, you know, than taking to make those numbers come back. when they can be caught and counted in nets. All right. So these are the factors that affect recruitment. A new word called fecundity, fecundity, age of reproductive maturity, growth rate, and habitat dependency. I'm going to talk about each of those right now. So fecundity is the reproductive rate of the fish and is measured by gametes. So if a fish makes more gametes, it's higher fecundity, okay? It's a measure of fertility. So if you remember R strategy and K strategy, the R strategy strategists have a higher fecundity than the K strategists, okay? Millions of gametes, but only a fraction will survive. Remember that? That's the R strategists. Measure of fertility. So age of maturity varies both within and between different species. And it depends on the growth rates. It depends on a lot of stuff. Growth rates, the masses, how, you know, the number, population densities, how many fish are in uh, a population, and the ratio of the males to females. And there is some evidence that overfishing can lower the average reproductive maturity. Younger, smaller fish matured faster, but obviously produced fewer gametes. That's why there are limits oftentimes, even for an angler like you or I, who have a, a permit that we just fish off the dock or fish off our own private boat, you're only allowed to take fish of certain sizes. Um, you would think ones that were too small would be off limits because they haven't matured yet. That's not always true. Oftentimes too big is also a problem because those are your reproducing population that are going to add, have a higher fecundity. Yeah? So they're going to be adding more and more gametes, more and more fertilization, more and more offspring to the population. 
So if you catch a big fish over a certain length, you have to put it back. And so you can see in Red Snapper, for example, uh, back in the 60s, these are the ones that were being caught. And as time went on, now you're getting this size. And yeah, they'll still produce eggs, but they're not producing, their fecundity is low. So um, we're kind of a little bit lower than the middle, or number three, growth rate, okay? So this is the speed at which the length or, uh, um, or mass increases. And we talked about these little guys, the, ele the alevin, uh, maturing into uh, an adult, right? And so the growth rate is, is influenced by all of these things. How much food is available? Temperature, oxygen, and of course, species of fish varies, right? Some species are naturally slow growing, while others are rapid growers and um, has an impact on age of reproductive maturity. Impact on age of reproductive maturity. Some species only start breeding once they have reached a particular size, which is many, I would say, many species only start breeding uh, once they have reached a particular size. It's obvious, biologically obvious. And the final one is habitat dependency. So um, many species of fish have complex life cycles. We know this already. We've learned about this. Here is your, uh, uh, this is mussels, okay? So, which is similar to many um, bivalve mollusks where you have different stages and they live in different environments. So these are your um, planktonic, floating around and going to different places. Here's where your velager starts to get heavier and it starts to lower, get lower because of gravity in the water column till finally it hits the bottom and if it finds the proper substrate, it survives into adulthood. If it doesn't, it will die off. And very similar things happen here, except you're not looking for substrate. You just, these, you know, rivers, estuaries and oceans, now you're changing environments completely, okay? If any one of those habits, habitats is lost or disrupted, the life cycle is disrupted and the recruitment rate is reduced. And now we're gonna talk about mortality. So we're on the next page, page 19. And obviously that's the rate at which, with which fish are dying. And we're gonna talk about two types, natural and fishing mortality, which, I mean, people eat the fish, hopefully, they don't go to waste, but we know that, for example, one pound of shrimp is four to 10 pounds of bycatch, wasted, killed, organisms. Natural mortality can take place um, as fish kills due to toxic blooms, zooplankton blooms, um, but also just from eating another fish, I mean, eating each other, uh, predation, right? Disease, starvation, natural disasters, Volcanic eruptions, a tsunami washing a whole population of fish up onto the, onto the shore and then receding and all the fish get left behind and die. Those kinds of things. And of course, they are influenced by climate and weather, which I just said. Other food web changes and human influence. So there's a question. In fishing lingo, what is the fisherman standing on in this picture? In fishing lingo, we talked about it in the NOAA ship. Um, it's this hump of organisms, you know, that were pulled up and dumped in a, so it's the P, 
pile, yeah, okay? And those unwanted organisms are known as, we know, the answer is bycatch, right? Okay. So fishing mortality. Now we're moving on from natural to fishing. Death of fish by fishing activities. And that includes harvest and selling. And it's relatively easy to assess from records of fish sold. Records of fish sold on land are easier to obtain than records of fish and other species gotten or killed as bycatch on the boats because we, we know that those records are often um, falsified, right? And then bycatch and other deaths caused by fishing. So more difficult to assess because they rely on reports of fishers. I'm not saying that all fishermen are uh, bad, okay? But as far as the ones that are making the difference, the bad difference. <clears throat> so fishing industries and scientists often disagree on estimates, obviously, right? The scientists who, are, who have good um, ethics will oftentimes con conflict their um, estimates from the industry, which their moral compass is driven by the almighty dollar, not by science, or which should be unbiased, or some other higher power, right? Okay. So the fishers, they're the stakeholders, right? Now this is a private fisherman uh, on, on a private boat. I just used that picture as an example. But um, they may not feel the short-term interest to report high fishing mortalities. So what are the effects of inaccurate estimation? And that's a question that I have there for you on the paper. What could be the result of bad reports? You can come back to that later if you want to. All right, we're on slide 111. And what would be a model for sustainable fishing, okay? So a simple approach to determine how many fish can be harvested at any one time is in order to be sustainable, the population must not be reduced below previous levels. <laughs> previous levels are already so low, right? So that's the whole point. Take less, leave more, all right? So recruitment, this is stated here, and you have to fill that in, in on your paper on the very bottom, that bar of page 19. Recruitment is greater than or equal to, we're all familiar with that sign from math, right? Maths. Um, natural mortality plus fishing mortality. Again, simple concept. More must be replaced than is leaving for sustainability to function. Recruitment is lower than the sum of mortality and fishing mortality, population will fall, and the fishing is unsustainable. So if we change that symbol to, to equal or less than or equal to um, at current rates and what, what has been done already to the ocean, unsustainable. So... <clears throat> This is just a summation of that whole thing, all right? Um, and we're going to be talking about some of this stuff coming up. So, so restrictions, su summary to ensure sustainability. So you have to have restrictions. It can't be a free-for-all. You have to have monitoring. There has to be an, an unbiased government entity with law enforcement working together with scientists, right, to monitor what's going on there. Law enforcement 
and scientists, okay, working together to maintain those restrictions. You can see how complicated it gets. It really shouldn't be so complicated. What's complicated is when it gets into politics and everything gets into politics. Here I have, a, I put this picture here, wildlife officers in Manatee County, which is just on the other side of our state. You can get to Manatee County in two hours, drive probably, um, seized more than 500 pounds of fish illegally, allegedly caught with an illegal gill net. Okay, so they were using um, method, a restricted method. And so they got in trouble for that. And then, of course, market-oriented tools. But we know about how true that symbol is because it all goes back to money. So um, we're on page 20, slide 113. Um, restriction by season. So we're going to talk about each of those restrictions. You've got... Um, Bans opposed on fishing, imposed on fishing in certain areas, certain times of the year. So you've got breeding seasons, migration seasons, juvenile maturation seasons, and a period of low fish stock population. That prevents fishing for a time. It enables those stocks, those numbers, to, for reproduction and immigration to increase. And then once the numbers get high enough again, they open up the water, okay? So here's a picture of, you know, of uh, what they have on the website, but here's mine, okay? So this was my fishing license from last year. I do have a fishing license because um, I still believe that you, if you wanna eat fish, you should get fish on your own. Go fishing, catch your own fish and you will not have to rely on giant destructive machines of death that are going out and raping the floor and the water of, of all the fish out there and life, okay? So if you just get what you want on your own, if you want, go, you know, if you want to have a piece of fish for dinner, go fishing. And, and you, won't have, you, you won't be eating fish every day, but once in a while, you know? which would, it's so much more sustainable that way, don't you think? And the money that you buy, the money that goes to your license, um, helps support that enforcement and monitoring and restriction, of those restrictions. So that is a positive thing. Even if you don't go fishing and you get a license, you're still helping support sustainability. All right, so there are advantages and disadvantages. I did not cover those in the, um, in the notes, but you hopefully filled all that out there. Yeah, this is slide 114, yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty clear what the advantages are. Um, just reducing negative effects overall, okay? And then the, um, the disadvantages would be uh, local fishers might would be affected by it. So the ones who are f trying to feed their family, right? Like what I just said with your fishing license. And of course, paying these individuals to go out there and enforce the rules. That's taxpayer money. All right, setting quotas. So now we are in the middle of page 20. Quotas are numbers, right? Um, restricting the number of fish to let stocks recover. And it, remember, we say fish, fishers, fishermen, but we're talking about all sea life. Here, I don't know who these people are, but they are a family who went scalloping. In the bay, you, every year the season opens and you can get a permit. And for each person who goes, you are allowed to bring back a certain volume, a quota of bay scallops. 
And they're little scallops. You can see they're not the big giant ones that the sea scallops, like the ones that I showed you. Um, they're little ones. But you still shuck them and get the meat out the same way, and they eat them, and it's, it's a fun activity. It's, it happens on the west coast, uh, just north of Tampa, and around the Tampa, Tampa area. Every year, um, I've never done it. I know people who have, they have a great time, but you need a boat, <laughs> you need a boat to get there, and you need a permit, okay? Um, so, but we're talking about all the fish and all the species as far as quotas go, okay? <clears throat> so, and if you catch more than you're allowed to have, you have to cover it up twice with the log on board, which we'll talk about in the future, and your sales records as well. If your company's selling more than you're allowed to catch, there's something wrong there, right? And despite their obvious value and um, fishing vessels, and there are many different fishing vessels and checking catches is not easy. Checking catches is not easy. You saw, I mean, bribery, right? Um, well, getting somebody in the boat in the first place, and then all those people who were reported to have been killed, who were standing up for the right thing and trying to report reality, and somebody off them. All right, so there are advantages and disadvantages to everything, obviously. Um, looks like we've got a nice catch. Yeah, thanks to quotas, we'll, be able, we'll probably have to throw half of these back, right? But, just a little switcheroo there. But let's say they do catch more. What happens to them when they pull them on board? They're all damaged, hurt, dying, right? Or dead. So they're... Even though they're keeping what they're allowed to keep, they're still catching more temporarily and still killing more than they should. Difficult to monitor is the hardest thing, okay? All right, and then licensing. Here's another permit of mine. It's from the bottom of page 20. Many countries, boat owners have to apply for a commercial fishing license or permit. Um, especially if you're taking out charters, like um, along the coast right here, you can get a charter boat that they need a commercial permit. If it's your own private boat and you're going for your own private purposes and you're not selling what you catch to the market, you don't need a commercial license, okay? Now in New York, a long time ago, uh, when I was 25 years old, um, I, for one season, now I would do this personally every year. I would go clamming and get a personal amount for personal use of clams. But this year, I wanted to try out commercially um, selling my clams to market. So I worked with my cousin, and who was on the next slide actually, and um, I got a shellfish, a commercial shellfish permit. It was $100, it was $100, and it allowed me to harvest, sort, because they, they uh, do it by size uh, over there, and then sell my clams to market and make money that way, okay? Now, modern licenses are not like this. Um, they have uh, electronic forms and scanners, and you can even like ping the license and see where the fishers are in their boats from space. Whoa, that's cool, it's cool. Um, and of course, if you're caught, you can lose your license, you can lose your vessel, you can get fines, you can even go to jail if you break the rules of the license. Big trouble. So here's my cousin. Uh, he is a commercial blue crab harvester in Cocoa Beach. I told, I talked to you about him before. Here he's, I, I actually went out with him uh, and his wife to uh, witness what they do, okay? Uh, a little bit of research. And, um, and I've been, I grew up crabbing I grew, in New York, okay? Um, but again, we did it for personal use up there. Here he's making a living out of this, and he did, makes a very good living as well, actually. 
He's got hundreds of traps out there, and they're all ticketed, meaning, or you know, they all have um, labels on them that are waterproof that show his uh, license number and and um, name and everything. So it's all you know, legal stuff. All right, and you can see the size of these blue claw crabs. Anybody ever eat blue claw crabs in here? Um, they're very good. <laughs> so um, and they're very. They're very expensive. Seafood is expensive. So uh, if you can do it physically, and you can make good money. Of course, it does not stop illegal fishing unless they're checked, okay? Like we saw that vessel pull up to that, uh, that fishing vessel, um, and the, you know, the soldiers went on board, and they, they got a fine, but they're probably going to go out and do it again, because if they do it all year and they only get caught once, it's worth it. It's worth the, the risk. All right, so, and now we've got lo by location. So now we're on the last page, page 21. Uh, we already were on page 21 from the last one, okay? And this is by location. So areas of the sea or the estuary or wherever um, or the beach could remain closed over a reef or whatever. And you can see in the bottom picture there, of uh, the slide, Hawaii. So this is an example of marlin fishing areas that are closed due to fishing um, because they want the numbers to come back or they are ecologically sensitive areas like reefs, coral reefs. And so um, you want to reduce that damage caused by fishing in those areas, preventing damage to those complex food chains uh, that support the rest of it, right? The estuary is the, is the nursery for so many ocean fish that if you go in there and just wipe out the estuary for one reason, oil spill, uh, building buildings filling in the estuary. I know that my hometown filled in part of the estuary to expand the town and the residential areas of the town. They went into the marshes and they filled them in with filter and then built houses and stores on top of that. Um, that's not typically legal anymore, hopefully. So, and then, um, yeah. So you're filling in the restriction, 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 and restriction, all, so low population, breeding area, nursery grounds, and ecologically sensitive areas. I mean, it all seems so logical, right? It all seems so, duh, you know? Why weren't we doing this a long time ago? Well, blindness. Um, hey, it's there. I can take it until they're no longer there and there's nothing left, right? We have to think more wisely than that. And then you've got advantages and disadvantages to this as well. Again, it's pretty obvious um, for you know, restrict, restricting uh, location, what that can do for the environment and to the industry, and then what the dis disadvantages, of course, are. And the biggest one really is, you know, disputes because they typically don't work out very well. Nobody can agree. All right, and the final one we're going to talk about today is restriction of method. And um, we will go more into this uh, later, but certain fishing methods are far more damaging than others. We know that. We know that the bottom trawl is, is the most destructive. We've talked about that already. Um, and the methods are permitted at different times of the year, so it's, it's combined with the other methods that, that really make a difference, okay? Mesh sizes, we talked about that already. Something called a TED, a turtle escape device. So you can see here, I think I put a picture in your notes. Um, so you've got the funnel where all of the shrimp come in. This happens right in the Gulf of Mexico, right here in Florida. And um, this was invented by and it's somebody where the, the shrimp can't get out, but the turtle will find its way out. Shrimp go through here, 
they'll fit through and they'll get trapped in the net. But the turtle will hit this grating and be forced up out of the opening and escape so that they can breathe air because they're air breathing organisms. Different bait um, on a long line so that certain species won't be attracted to it and the ones they're targeting are. That's hard though. And then ban that benthic trawling. Ban it. Okay, that is part four of our notes. Like I said, we're gonna do, we are going to do part five um, also, but then part six, the last part, is going to be a project-based uh, notes. I'm trying to think outside of the box um, so we can fit everything into uh, before exams.